So, so, all right, you were born in Sicily, and did, did you come to this country as a child, or did you? I was 17 okay. when I came to the United States. Okay, and I'm, I'm interested myself in how you came to meet the Cabrini sisters, and, and what was that like, and where did they meet you, or you meet them? I was in Chicago, and my cousin worked at Columbus Hospital, which she knew everybody spoke Italian. And that's the only place she could get a job for me. So she asked, and the superior, she took me for the job, and later said that I won't enter the convent, you know? And she told me to go to church and pray. So you go to church and pray, and what happens? I liked, I kind of felt in love with Mother Cabrini's room where she died. And uh, because they told me the story, the mother Cabrini loved the children. And while she was doing when she was dying, prepare candy for Christmas for the children. And that's what really, uh, to see the bed where she slept, the room and everything, you know, I, I, I felt good in there. I, and I used to go there every day to pray. And how how did you, so you were doing this, but how did you make this decision? It's a big decision, isn't it? Yes, because I did have that in mind. Uh, when I was in Italy, and when I came over here, I was kind of depressed because I was no longer with the sisters over there, a different order. And then when I was able to work at Columbus, I was really happy. Yeah. When you first came into the Institute, did you understand anything about the charism? Or did, how did, what did you think of the charism at that time? Actually, I did not know anything. Anything. Uh, in the novitiate, I was on my own. I didn't, there was no class, nothing, because I didn't understand English. So me, I did everything on my own. Pray on my own, a prayer. For me, it was enough formation. You know, whatever I picked up was later on on my own. And if, what, what do you think about the charism now? Now, in, at this point in your life and after so many years in the Institute? Um, I say Mother Cabrini's charism was to help the poor and be there for them and trust in the sacred heart that he will give her the strength to do it. And that's what I liked about it. You lived in community all this time? Yes. Tell me what it's like to live in community, please. Uh, to live in community is not an easy task. Uh, it's at times very difficult to do things that you really don't like to do. At times, it's okay, but it's very challenging. When you think how you're going to grow in your faith, in your formation, um, I think I was pretty strong in my vocation because when something was going wrong with some of the sisters, I was thinking of leaving the convent, but then I said to myself, I did not come in for them. I came for God, and I'm not leaving for them. The time will come, the things will change. And how did that work out for you? It did. It gave me strength, courage to do, you know, things that I, what I thought I couldn't do. And I went on like that keep hoping for the best. You, we joked a little bit earlier, but you took some vows of obedience. Chastity. chastity and poverty. And poverty. Could, so could you please re repeat those and then tell me what that means to you. Uh, poverty, a chastity, we know that we don't, have, we don't go out with the guys and all that. We know that poverty, we had to be poor our possessions. We cannot have this, this, and that. 
which now I see the term is changing. A poverty means for me to do God's will. It's not my will, but His will. Uh, and obedience to do what He asks you to do. And when you're, when you're tasked with something challenging or difficult, how do you approach that? How do you seek guidance? Uh, I never went for help. I did it on my own. My hope was what saved me many times. You know, my hope and my strength that God was with me. And now continue on. Many of the sisters have said, oh, this is something that changed my life. Some, something happened or I saw something or I experienced something while I was a sister. Is there any one thing or two things that stand out for you? In Houston, that's what changed my life because I always thought very low of my self, you know, self-esteem, thinking that I cannot do this, I cannot do that. But when I went to Houston, I was asked to, to take over quinceanera, which I didn't even know what quinceanera meant, because the other one left, took everything with her. And when I was asked to do it, I had nothing to begin with, nothing. So I said, okay, I want to develop my own program. So I did. When I felt good, it was when I was teaching in class about that, Two people came, two teachers from different places, and I knew them. I said, oh, hi, welcome. She said, oh, I came because I want to see what you're going to say, teach, because I heard you have a good program. That I felt so good at that time, thinking that, yes, I can do it. Like Mother Cabrini said, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Yeah. And that's what helped me to go on and to keep hope. And then you got a challenge, and you can tell me about the challenging position you got in Colorado. Yeah, the challenge was that I was all over. I was like, I had to go to the meeting downtown, then some of the sisters were sick, take care of them at the same time. It was very heavy for me at that time, and you had a people that uh, they were not all there to say the least. And I was taking care of all that, you know, but it was very, very heavy at that time. How would you describe your ministry today? <sighs> today ministry in this house is, I had to be compassion to all those around me. I never judge anybody because you don't know if that is the true story. I made the resolution not to judge anybody and um, be compassionate when other people, f you know, have faults or whatever. Or, you know, be like Christ to them. You know, like my mother said, now I can die in peace because I saw you serving the other sisters. They couldn't walk. So that's what I keep thinking of that, what my mother said. Wow. Wow. What was most fulfilling to you? What, what pleased you the most of your work? First of all, I, it was very fulfilling, the novitiate. They put me in the novitiate as an assistant, you know? And uh, it was a beautiful uh, prayer service. Uh, we were like community and everybody was kind to one another. And that was an enrichment for my faith, you know? And uh, that was the best of my life, I would say. When we were praying, we have a meeting, a discussion about the gospel, and th which I did not have in the novitiate. So for me, that was very, very important. And I was very sad when I left because I had to move by a whole obedience. So that's, that was the best time of my life. 
you worked in education. Yes. And you talked a little bit about St. Donatus. Your favorite was kindergarten? Yes. So tell, tell me about St. Donatus. Tell me about kindergarten. Yeah, I used to teach kindergarten. And I was kind of proud of myself that I was able to do it when I said, no, I cannot do it. I never was in the classroom. But because I obey, they said, try, try. So I did. And I enjoy when I used to teach kindergarten to teach the parable, like the Good Shepherd and uh, the, everybody, the children did their part because they liked that. That's how they learn. That's the way I find out that they learn. One was a sheep, one was a pastor. And it's enjoyable. And uh, I felt I was really a mother to some of the children they had nobody to take care, that takes care of them in the street. So um, can you, when you, I saw you looking up, sort of, you had a picture in your head, yes? Can you describe that picture, what that looks like? Well, I can tell you that I had a little boy in my class. I was not taking care of him. He was in the street all the time. And I had another boy that was abused and he was adopted and then he came to the United States. And I had a watch for that boy constantly that all the children used to tell me, sister, Michael's in the closet. He, cl he locks himself in. And I, they, they knew the problem I had and they used to help me by telling me Michael's over there. And the other boy, I took care of him because nobody took care of him at home. I took him home, I cleaned him up, washed his clothes, I gave him to eat and go back in the classroom. He never forgot that, never. He used to look for me all over the place. So about that, I feel good. I feel wonderful that I did that. And I had the energy to do it that time too. You know, I was younger. <laughs> I think you could still do it. I think you could still do I it. Know. Tell so. Um, I know you worked in California, um, but where did you work? Where did you work with immigrants? You you are an, an immigrant yourself, yes. Yes. Tell me about this. Okay, and I worked with them in New Jersey and then in California and Seattle, and. Some of them were immigrants, you know, and I used to take care of them after school, take care of them and uh, take care of their needs. And they used to sleep there. And the kids, I love the kids, you know, and um, it was a good time for me. You spoke only Italian first, then you learned English. But these immigrants, are these Italian people? Tell me who, what kinds no, of people. No, they were. <laughs> No, no, all English, but a little by little on my own, I start to learn English. We used to read the meditation in the morning church. I read my own in Italia and the other people aloud learn English. And I used to follow. I said, oh, that's what the word means. I tried to memorize that little by little when people, and that's how I learned English. You know, and I told people, please correct me when I make a mistake, because I don't know. I want to learn it right. And they used to correct me, you know. That, in other words, I gave them permission not to feel embarrassed to correct me. It's not my language, you know. The same thing with Spanish. I learned on my own. So, so you gave permission. That takes courage. Yeah, tell me. I knew there were college people, teachers, and I knew that they would speak correctly. And I want to learn correctly. And I, I was so anxious to learn the language so I could be able to communicate with them, you know? And I said, I want you to tell me when I talk to you, if I make a mistake, don't stay quiet. Let me know. I will not get offended. I'm telling you, correct me. I want to know the right way. So they did correct me. Nice. Were you 
when you worked with immigrants, did you just work? You didn't just work with Italian immigrants. No, no. Tell, tell me about the kinds Everybody. of people. We had people that used to come to school in California, and then bring the children there for the week and sleep there. And then they came and picked them up for the weekend. Not all of them. Some of them, they stayed with me because nobody would pick them up. So uh, there was immigrants. Did, did you ever get, did you ever get um, an assignment that at first, <laughs> did they tell you to go someplace where at first you didn't want to go, but it turned out to be okay? Tell us about it. Well, I, I was in the novitiate, the formation. And then after a few years, they wanted me to go back with the, the other community where I was before. And I did not want to go back knowing that I was going from heaven to hell. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I did not want to go back. I was crying, crying. They said, no, 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 you have grown a lot and they need you there. It, it drives me crazy. They need you there. So I had to go back. I had no choice. So I went back. And then after a few months, they put me back and they need me back in the novitiate. <laughs> Do you, um, so there are some very good things about the Institute. Yes. What do you think is are one or two of the best strengths? Um, New York, a Cabrini Shrine. I loved the mission because I felt I was helping people with pain. And they used to come and cry for different things and I was I felt so good to be able to help and comfort them you know even though I didn't say a word just put your hand on his shoulder and listen there were people coming from all over the world especially Spanish people they used to come to they want to pray for the children for their husband and they used to stop me and and I said, what can I do, you know, to pray to Mother Cabrini, my husband is, so I used to give them a novena and tell them to pray, come to the shrine and pray for the grace. Uh, even the people, one girl that had a vocation, I met her by Mother Cabrina or uh, by the steps, she had a vocation. But I told her what to do, and she was happy to get some directions because she didn't know what to do, what, where to begin. And uh, that's what made me feel good, too. Now, and you started telling me something before. If you could tell me about the 373 steps and how many times you went up and got called back. So oh, tell us about 373. Especially on Saturday or Sunday that I started going up, uh, or halfway up, and then I came down because they called me. Then I finished, tried to get up there again because I want to see the people up there. Again, the The third time I was able to climb the stairs and get up there before they called me. <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed the ministry there because I knew there were people that were looking uh, for somebody that would talk to them and advise them you know, what to do, depend on what the situation was. So, because not everybody has been to the shrine. So if you can give me a word picture, you're standing next to the shrine, how you're dressed and how mm. somebody might come to you? Oh yes, I used to be over there and people used to come to me and, and ask me questions. Um, because over there we used to have the habit, when I am in mission, I dressed as a religious. Because it's, for me, it's important to dress the way when you are on a mission. At home, with the house is okay. But a lot, a lot of people, they want to talk to you. You know, they pray, you know, for the loved ones. And they want to know. But we used to have Mother Cabrini found the water at the shrine in Colorado. And a lot of people used to come and drink that water. Mother Cabrini so they can be healed. And some that received the miracle. What, what, so Mother Cabrini was a, an American citizen, but yes. she was an Italian. Yes. 
What does it mean to you to have an Italian-American saint? I feel I have company. <laughs> Mother Cabrini, sure, I feel like it's part of me because she went through the same thing. You know, she didn't understand English and neither did I, but yet we became citizens. And uh, I, I feel strong about that, about Mother Cabrini being a citizen. I helped other people become a citizen at the shrine <clears throat> that they did not have the green card or whatever they asked me how to go about it. And I used to help them, you know, go over there to get information. And then they, when they became citizens, they used to come back and say, sister, I got my citizenship. And they were happy, you know. Even for the green card, I used to help them for the green card. And they used to come and thank Mother Cabrini for that miracle. Can you tell me why the MSCs or how the MSCs are different? I don't want to say better, but different than others. They're different because our spirit is different than other people. We are people that make feel people welcomed when they come, hospitality. We try to be very hospitable to, hospital, to other people, no matter who they are, what religion, what, everybody's welcome in this place, everybody. I look back and I said, you know, I never thought of it. And I said, I have accomplished a lot. And I am happy to have done that. And I want to continue that way, no matter what. Even if I'm older, I still can do things. And that's what I am now in my faith. If you had a girl in front of you who was considering a vocation. Yes. How would you describe your life to her so she could get a picture of the, the, the joyous life that you live? I would say to her, always look up, never look back. What you did wrong, but what you did right. And keep hoping that God is with you. He will never let you fall. It's very nice. Thank you, sister.